Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Stephen Dubner. Stephen's an award-winning author, journalist, and TV and radio personality. He's co-author of the Freakonomics books, which have sold millions of copies in 40 languages. And he's host of Freakonomics Radio, which gets 8 million global monthly downloads and is heard by millions more on NPR stations and other radio outlets around the world. Hey, Stephen, it's great to have you. How are you? Hi, Mark and Kevin. I am... Well, considering, you know, pandemic, et cetera, um, everything going on, everything going on, it's making life interesting and challenging. And, you know, um, and I, like you guys, and I'm sure everybody listening to this is kind of balancing between feeling grateful for what you can afford to be grateful for and um, feeling, you know, mournful and hopeful for the other things. So Mm -hmm. that's how I'm doing. That was a that was a longer answer than you were looking yeah, for. Right. You wanted well, me to say, "I'm fine, thank you." We asked. We asked. You. We asked. Yes, but we're so glad that you've uh, are joining us, and um, you're one of the most interesting people in the world. So we'd like to hear what kinds of things that you're interested in these days. I immediately term- distrust the rest of what you're going to say because I right. know that I'm not one of the most interesting people in the world. But I'm just going to take it as empty praise and move on. Well, okay, empty praise and moving on. Um, we're interested in kinds of uh, tools that you um, come to use and love. And um, maybe you can t- tell us about your first one. Sure. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if some or all of my tools are actually lifted from cool tools over the years <laughs> because um, I, I'm a user. Um, and I do appreciate the whole notion of, you know, f- I mean, I think I like probably you guys and a lot of people who listen to this are constantly in search of incremental improvements in anything. So uh, my first one are the the shoes I wear probably about 363 and a half days of the year, um, which are Onitsuka Tigers, Mexico 66, these sneakers that um, have a kind of interesting history. Uh, among the earliest um, dedicated athletic shoes um, designed and made in Japan, they also played a role in the um, the 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 founding or the the enthusiasm of Phil Knight and the founding of Nike. I believe, if I recall correctly, I may have it wrong. I believe that he, as a as an enthusiastic runner and shoe dog, as he later called himself, uh, I believe he imported Onitsuka Tigers way, way, way back when, and that somehow that fed into what became the, the Nike mission. But basically, um, I was a cross-country runner in high school, and we had these shoes that were lightweight and made just for running. You didn't really wear them around. And... Um, there was something about them being purpose built, you know, made for running. You know, I also played, uh, you know, sports, baseball and basketball. And, you know, there were shoes for those things, but these running shoes felt a little more exotic, maybe because running wasn't that big a deal. And um, so I wore them very excitedly back then, even though I hated running and still hate running. So I, I run a little bit just because I feel like I should, even though I hate it. But then um, over the years, as I got older and started, you know, just continued to read and think about the body and exercise and so on, I came across this literature on barefoot exercise, and that led down a rabbit hole and another rabbit hole. And and I realized I wasn't going to go around barefoot because the world is too built up to really be barefoot. But I did want to go to some form of minimalism. And then I found out that these Onitsuka tigers had been resurrected, I think, in the early 2000s. And now they're kind of a style sneaker. Um, Uma Thurman wore a pair in um, a movie that I didn't see. I want to say Kill Bill, <laughs> maybe. Um, oh, interesting. And anyway, I I love them because they're essentially, uh, you know, they're sort of a ballet flat, really, that you can wear every day. They're incredibly lightweight. And I'd come to believe through, including through an episode, we did a Freakonomics radio called Something Like These Shoes Are Killing Me, where we looked into the 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 physiology of of feet and how humans are meant to walk and run. And, you know, we aren't meant to wear these big built up shoes with all these cushioning and, and so on. And in fact, there's good reason to think that where the more protection you wear, the more your body kind of atrophies and responds in the wrong ways. And so 
these are sneakers that I, um, that they're, they're comfortable enough to barely know you're wearing a shoe. They're supportive enough to walk on, you know, anything, rocks, whatever. They're, they're actually shoes. Um, you can run and play golf and do anything in, in them. And they also come in enough styles and colors and so on that if you care about such things, which I tend to mostly not, you can have a beautiful pair that you can wear as the equivalent of a dress or work shoe. And so I think they are a really cool tool. And um, if you were to describe them, they're kind of, are they made of like canvas or leather? Are they kind of a canvas, like a van sneaker? Or are they more like the leather that, um, you know, uh, a Nike might be in and, I believe the earliest were some kind of nylon and now they're a combo, you know, the different models are a little bit different. I think the ones I typically wear are, I, of course I say I wear them all day, every day when I'm inside, I just have my slippers on, which is what I have on now. So I'm not actually looking at them, but yeah, I think they're leather, they're leather and some suede and then a very thin and soft rubber sole. And they weigh like almost zero. So if you pick it up, if you were to pick up an Onitsuka Tiger in your hand and walk around for 20 minutes, you would forget you're holding something in your hand. That's how light they are. And therefore, the idea is because they're so light and because they're not offering you a ton of support, that your feet actually do the work that your feet are meant to do, which is actually like, you know, walk with some, uh, you know, motion, not just clump down in a big um, you know, like a, like a, well, I was going to disparage dinosaurs, assuming that they weren't nimble, but you know, a big clumping, clomping foot, it's more of a nimble foot where you kind of land on the ball and, and, and rotate down and so on. And, um, and they're really, um, and they're beautiful too. They're very streamlined and they have a lot of the, the, the hallmarks of good Japanese design in terms of materials and what looks to be like hand stitching. I have no idea if it is. So yeah, they're, um, aesthetically they're, they're primo. What color do you wear? Well, Mark, that's a complicated question. Um, <laughs> because, um, so I, I, I was sworn to the, um, uh, there's a beautiful bright yellow, what I call, what I would consider like a goldenrod yellow with black stripes. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Um, bumblebee. Yeah, bumblebee is exactly right. And I, I wore those and nothing but those for several years. Um and then I found out that Uma Thurman wore them in the movie, and I was increasingly getting people saying, oh, the Uma Thurman shoes. <laughs> and I have nothing against Uma Thurman. In fact, I used to be friendly with her. My, 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 uh, a girlfriend from long ago was good friends with Uma, and we used to, before she was really famous, we'd hang, and, I, and she's super smart and nice, so I, I thought that's cool. But I didn't want to be like wearing some movie shoe. So that kind of that kind of set me back a little bit. And the problem was I buy them in bulk because I'm always scared that anything I like is going to go away. So I would buy three or four or five pairs at a time. And then, you know, when one would wear out. So at about the time I decided I didn't want to wear yellow anymore, I probably still had three pairs of new ones in the closet. In fact, I probably still have one or two pairs of new ones. And then I converted to a white with blue and red stripes that are so beautiful. The problem white I get a little that. bit beat up, but boy. Good. So I think the photo that I sent you guys, if people can look at that, th those are the kind of current pair. They're, they're pretty beat up, but you can imagine like a new pair of those white. They're white on white with suede and leather. Um, I did wear um, that very pair when they were brand new to a wedding with a, a, a summer suit back when people went to things like that last Very summer. Very snazzy. <laughs> what kind of socks do you wear with them? Oh, now we're really getting into the details here. <laughs> well, <that> matters. <laughs> interesting, interesting you ask that. Oh, this would have been a cool tool. Um, there is a sock that my wife got for me as a present. I like to cook, even though I'm not a real cook of any sort. And there are some chef socks made by some company whose name I don't know. And they're very colorful. And they have, they come up to about maybe mid calf and they come uh, and they, uh, they have sayings on the bottom where theoretically nobody sees them except for when you put your feet up, things like get shit done and, you know, go, go, go. And they're also kind of padded and, and, um, and, you know, they're, they're thick. They're, in fact, they're probably thicker than the sole of the Onitsuka tiger. And those <laughs> go great with the Onitsuka tiger. They, um, yeah. Yeah. And so you said it was, you said it was, um, you describe this as a chef sock. What, what's a chef sock? I think it's meant to be thick and absorbent, but aren't all socks 
I mean, it's just thick, but I, I think they're just marketed as chef socks. Um, they have a B on them. The company is called Headley and Bennett and they make Headley socks. And Bennett. Headley and Bennett. They're beautifully chaotically designed socks with like five or six different types of patterns. There's like a plaid piece of uh, a striped piece, a polka dot piece, all in one sock. Very distinctive, very beautiful. Oh yeah, here's here's one of the the phrases on the bottom is "wake up and fight." That's what the socks say okay. on the bottom. Cool. So 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 you have very colorful shoes, colorful socks. Do you keep all your color down at your feet, or are you dressing in the kind of um, Timothy Leary style, or 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 what? Yeah, no, I'm a New Yorker. I wear I'm legally bound to wear nothing but um, black. black and occasionally gray during the summer. But no, all the color is down at the feet. Yeah. If you hide it down there. <laughs> I also do find this sounds terrible, but um as I got older, I realized I really liked wearing bright colored sneakers, white or gold, because <laughs> at the time, a few years ago, we started doing a lot of live shows, Freakonomic Radio live shows, and I'm I'm hosting this show in these old theaters and you're coming out with just a little bit of stage light. And I literally couldn't see my feet when I'm walking, if I'm wearing like dark, like a leather shoe. So I realized that one advantage of the bright shoe was that I could see where I was walking in the near dark. <laughs> Excellent. That's a Garrison Keillor's excuse too. Is that right? He, where he wears bright shoes. Red shoes. Oh. He has, he's go. always, wear, and he, in fact, he got the idea from another radio weekend host show um such thompson in san francisco who started wow. wearing bright red shoes hmm. for his weekly radio live show look it's at that most- i thought i had a marginally original thought <laughs> 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 excuse me so Stephen, what's a uh, second uh, cool tool for you my second cool tool is uh oh anchovy paste i can't mm-hmm. this is this is not exotic or unknown unless it is i'm guessing that most people who cook know about anchovy paste but you know everybody's at different stages of learning and when i learned to use anchovy paste in my cooking i felt like it was it it was the first cool tool of cooking i learned years ago and now i we keep it again stocked in abundance and basically if you don't know anchovy paste it is the paste of anchovies in a kind of toothpaste tube type tube. Um, I know you've had past guests talk about things like fresh basil in a tube. So this is, you know, a a tube of food, but but anchovy paste really works well in a tube. I also like um, really good concentrated tomato paste in a tube and garlic paste in a pinch maybe, but anchovy paste is like the, you know, the, the the nitro version of the umami that you need and whatever you need. So for instance, if you want to make the best Brussels sprouts ever, um, you would chop your Brussels sprouts relatively small, or at least this is what I would do. And then you saute um, maybe some shallots and or garlic, whatever, in your butter and or oil before the Brussels sprouts hit the pan. But it's the anchovy paste that you put in while you're sauteing there that will just bring it to the next level. Also works for all kinds of sauces and is just a really good thing to have around, especially if you have someone in your family that does not eat fish and is scared of all things from the sea, but also likes flavorful things. So you just have to hide it. And occasionally I'll make a, 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 a label um, for something else and call it like, you know, clown juice and put it on the anchovy paste <laughs> canister. And so that we fool everybody. But yeah, um, there's a brand called Amore, which happens to be Italian. I'm not sure their anchovies are any tastier than the others, but it's really useful. So I was going to ask if there was a particular brand that you prefer. There's, I see looking online, a bunch of them, Cento, mm-hmm. um, and yep. whether there's any differences in your book. You know, um, I've used them all. I um, I I settled on Amore because uh, I liked it and I'm a creature of habit. And, you know, the more shortcuts we can have in life, the better. Like, that's the one I know to look for. I'm also generally not a maximizer. I'm a little bit more of a satisficer in life. Um, I try to save my maximizing for those rare occasions, like the work that I care about. But I'm not going to, I mean, like Kenji Lopez-Alt, whom I love, he would probably, and maybe has, 
um, taken, you know, eight tubes of anchovy paste and compared them, you know, uh, as they are and then in different foods and come to a conclusion. And I love that he does that, but I won't. And Amore is one that I happen to think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great way of, of uh, the strategy, life strategy of being kind of selective <laughs> yeah. optimization. Um, I make miso soup and I use dashi, which is like this kind of cooking broth made yep. from bonito fish flakes. And I think it has some dried seaweed in it. I wonder if anchovy paste could work in a pinch as a substitute in miso soup. That's Have you ever tried an that? Interesting idea. Um, so you add to it, maybe add a uh, layer of it. Yeah, no. I uh, I don't know. I think you should do it and let us know. I'll I mean, I, I I'll report. I that. think you should do both. I think you should substitute and complement and see what happens. Right. Yeah. yeah. Try, try both. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. It's a good one. So, uh, what next do you have on your? You list have a puzzle. Looks like I do. So I don't know if this is. Uh, yeah, I guess this would be a tool. So. Um, so in my family, my kids are now teenagers, um, college actually. So they're not really jigsaw puzzle. You know, we don't do jigsaw puzzles as a family the way we did when they were younger. Um, but my wife still likes a jigsaw puzzle now and again, but she'd really put it aside for years and years. But during the pandemic, like a lot of people, she was looking for activities to do. And um, although now that I think about it, I think sh sh I take that back. She she started on this before covid for some reason she just you know felt like doing some jigsaw puzzles and so she had a few and in fact the the reason i remember it was before is because my wife got very sick with covid and so we quarantined her at home and it was really um you know it was it was tough and um and one of the first things she was able to do when she was starting to recover was get down uh she had it on the floor to do the the jigsaw puzzle so the puzzle kind of became the symbol of um, her quarantine and to this date now, you know, a few months later, um, she's still doing um, jigsaw puzzles. And we all pitch in now and again. But for Mother's Day, um, my daughter, uh, teenage daughter, found uh, a really nice um, gift idea, which was a custom made jigsaw puzzle made of a photo that you send in. So, again, I'm, sh I'm sure other people have heard of this. I, I hadn't. I mean, it doesn't shock me that it exists, but I was thrilled that it does exist. And so. We selected a photo that she thought um, uh, that we thought she would like a lot. It was a photo of um, we were playing. My son and I play this board game, an election board game, and um, the the our little dog had its paws up on the table over the game as if it was playing the board game. So it's one of those you know kind of vaguely comical anthropomorphizing dog photos. But but it happened that this photo happened to have a lot of things in the background that really read like our family. There was a, a portrait on the wall behind this scene that showed the four of us. And there was a, an old photograph of my wife's dad in, in the army um, on, on the sidewall. So it was this photo that was like composed of all these things that represented our family. And we turned that into a jigsaw puzzle uh, and gave it to my wife, Ellen, for, for Mother's Day. And when the box comes from this company, um, you know, they, they have a message. We put something like happy mother's day, love you, da, da, da. And it was, um, one of the best gifts that's ever happened. I will say this, the company that we use is called puzzle you. So while I am promoting them, I also have to just be honest. It was not a great puzzle as jigsaw puzzles go, because there's a pretty high variance in puzzle jigsaw puzzle quality and you know so like ravensburger is kind of the mass german one that were that's very well done where the pieces are just cut very well and with this one <laughs> my wife ran into a lot of instances where a piece would fit in like four different spots and you know that's not great puzzle making wow but um so maybe there's another company out there that customizes with a higher quality puzzle. Maybe Puzzle U had an off day. Maybe Puzzle U is working to make their puzzle pieces um, a little bit better. But it didn't really matter at the end of the day because she finished the puzzle. It's a photograph that gives us all great joy. And then she bought this glue that you rub over the front of the puzzle to make it you know, stick. And now it's going to hang somewhere on the wall and it will be kind of the happiest remembrance of <laughs> the quarantine habit because uh -huh. it's a, it's a photo that we, um, we love. 
And what's the size? Like, what's the largest? Maybe the largest size you could go with, just to give some people an idea. Um, ours was a hundred yards by thirty yards. No, <laughs> yes, ours was a million um, pieces. <laughs> I think. Well, it was either five hundred or a thousand pieces. I think we got it a thousand pieces. But you have variants when you order on the site. You can choose both the physical size of your puzzle, and then correspondingly, there are a few. Um, uh, puzzle uh, number of pieces within that size. So, you know, if you want the the kind of big, easy one. And we got, I think, what was the equivalent of the most difficult one because, you know, she's a puzzle professional, essentially. Right. You know, right. we didn't want to make it too easy for her. Yeah. Sure. That's wonderful. That's a great, cool tool. And as you say, a uh, perfect gift for the right person. Agreed. Um, so, uh, Stephen, what's your fourth cool tool? You will laugh. You will ridicule. You will mark me. <laughs> That's our job. As, you will mark me as a combination luddite and well, it's not the opposite of a luddite, but something else really bad. Um, my fourth cool tool and my most important by far is Microsoft Word. Uh huh. It is a computer program made by I've a company heard, I've heard of it. called I've heard Microsoft. Of it. And it, it is for making words, things like writing. <laughs> so look, I recognize that I love Microsoft Word in part because I've been using it for a long time. I'm a writer. It's what I do. I've written a mm. lot of books. I've used Word on all of them. Although I should also say I started writing, you know, before Microsoft Word existed. And the first computer I wrote on was something called the IBM Display Writer, which had all these a huge um, floppy disk drive and like <laughs> there was like one disk for composing and another disk for editing and another disk for spell checking and so on. So, um, so it's not like I'm wed to it cause it was the only program I ever used. I used word perfect and I wrote on Commodores and I wrote on early <laughs> Mac and, and so on. But I think word is an amazing program um, because it does everything I would ever want it to do for any kind of writing. And and I only use probably about a half a percent of it. And I got to know a little bit Nathan Mirvold, one of the, the former CTO of Microsoft, um, who I believe was involved along with a, a lot of other people in creating this and had some conversations just about it. And I'm just constantly amazed at how well thought through it is. And I know some people get intimidated by it. I know some people think it's overkill. I know some people think it's not modern and beautiful enough. Um, but I think it, it's a tool that helps me do my best work writing, and I'm really, um, truly grateful for it. If I'm not mistaken, the most the, the tool that has been recommended or talked about most than any other tool in this podcast is Scrivener, mm -hmm. which is a tool for writing books. Yeah. And um, uh, you mentioned writing books. So uh, do you write – your your books in word without um something like scrivener I, I do i do so i i looked at scrivener a long time ago honestly i don't remember anything about it. so tell me tell me what's great about scrivener and i'll see if i recall a little bit more well the the metaphor is uh three by five cards yeah and the idea is that you um are writing on cards yeah. that you can move around yeah um so it's maybe less of a writing thing, but more of the kind of architectural mm -hmm. editing function that, yeah, um, the organizing, the and organizing the editing, thing and the research too. You can just like, it'll, it'll accept anything you throw at it. YouTube videos, your, um, MP3 files of your recordings, websites, uh, photos. So I just like dump all that stuff in when I'm writing a book and it's all there. Um, and you love I've it. Never had a problem with it. I love it. Yeah. It syncs with my uh, with my iOS devices, so I have it on an iPad and a phone. If I want to do some writing on my phone, then I know when I get back to the desktop, it'll be there. It is awesome. So my fourth cool tool is Scrivener. <laughs> I used to use I used to use Microsoft Word, but then I went on a podcast. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. Um, I actually still use Microsoft Word, but kind of reluctantly, um, because it is the lingua franca. It is the, the the standard. And when I'm submitting things to places like Wired, um, they sort of demand it. Although I will often um, write these days in, um, even before Scrivener, in Google Docs, uh, if I have to do anything collaboratively. Yeah. I know mm -hmm. that Microsoft 
has, I think it's called Microsoft One or something. There is kind of a version of that. So do you yeah. do you um, use that part of Microsoft Word? So we've tried and not succeeded yet. Um, mm-hmm. But I think one of the reasons we haven't succeeded as a team is because we're pretty wedded to, wed to um, uh, Google Docs, which I don't like. I mean, I find it. Um, you know, it's adequate, um, but it's, it, there are a lot of, it's features that are, um, imprecise and inconsistent and kind of, and glitchy. And lacking. Looking. Yeah. Well, for so, instance, it doesn't have track changes. Correct. Uh, yeah. And that's a big, that's a big problem. Although I will say one of the biggest problems with Microsoft Word is if you do write a book on Microsoft Word and have, I, I can't remember now whether it's track changes alone or track changes in concert with a lot of footnotes or endnotes your document can become very fragile and that's not good um that was the last time i wrote a book which was a few years ago so i don't i don't know if that's been addressed um yeah i don't like google docs but i do a lot so honestly the way we do freakonomics radio is a, a um it's a story of constant conversion back and forth in that our producers will write a prep for me that, and i think most of them write originally on google docs because they're used to it um, and then they send it to me in Microsoft Word form because they know I prefer that. And then I work with that prep to do the interview. The interview then becomes obviously audio. That's a Dropbox file that then is then that is then converted into um, a transcript via Trint and then fed into Google Docs, which is updated. Which we, we then uh, have a human um, update the machine version of the transcript which is then downloaded as a, as a Microsoft word doc again and sent to me (laughs) along with the script that the producer writes originally originating in Google docs, which they again convert to Microsoft word for me. And then I work with a, a, a handful of Google of Microsoft word documents to rewrite the script, which I then re upload to Google docs. And then when we're actually in, in tracking the narration of an episode and doing the mixing, then it stays in Google Docs. So we we do this ridiculous toggling just because I much prefer Microsoft Word. And it's stupid, but it works, which I would, ar- would, would argue describes a lot of all of our lives. Well, that's, sure. evol- that's evolution. By yeah, the way. exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. So Stephen, in, in a couple of minutes we have left, I think Everybody who listens to this is familiar with your fantastic Freakonomics books um, and podcast and uh, the podcast and, and Freakonomics radio. But tell us about your radio network, because you have shows that I, I think that people might not have heard about, but um, they probably should know about. Yeah, I hope so. That would be that would be great. So, yeah, Freakonomics radio has been around a relatively very long time now, 10 years at the time, I think there were 50,000 podcasts in existence. I believe that in the month of June 2020, there were more than 100,000 new podcasts launched in that month alone. And now there's something like 1.2 million podcasts. So we are relative, wow. like when, when, when I started this, you know, it felt late to the podcast game. And as it turns out, it was, it was, it was more on the early side. And, um, it's been um, a joy. I love doing it. Um, it's journalism, it's writing, it's all those things, but in, in different format. And so we never really knew, you know, there, there's always, there's a, there was always a lot of conversation about, should we do more different, turn it into a, you know, whatever, a brand, an empire, education, da, da, da. And I never really did any of that. I just really liked making the show every week kind of, you know, as, as, as good as we can. But then uh, w- there were just certain curiosities that I felt we weren't getting all the time. And so we thought about starting some some new shows. So that's the Freakonomics Radio Network represents our effort to do that. We're, we're trying to do it slowly and judiciously. The first show we've launched is uh, one called No Stupid Questions, which again has me in it, uh, along with my friend Angela Duckworth, who's a brilliant and fun and funny person who is a research psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania. She wrote the book called Grit, which is a really good book. And mm-hmm. and so in No Stupid Questions, it's very different from it's it's a little bit like Freakonomics for psychology, but not quite because it's less um reported. You know, Freakonomics Radio, we often interview two, three, five people for one episode, then knit it together. And and no stupid questions, we each ask 
um, we each ask the other one question in a given episode and then do our best using research to answer the question. So that's up and running and doing pretty well. And um, my my Freakonomics co-author, Steve Levitt, who's an economist at the University of Chicago, we are getting ready to launch a show of his with him as host. Inter- it's an interview show. And it is to be called People I Mostly Admire. And it's um, <laughs> it's conversations. You know, Levitt is a very a very unusual human. He's really smart, but he's smart in unusual ways and he has unusual curiosities. And so he'll be talking to um, noteworthy people. They might be in academia. They might be in whatever politics, business, entertainment. Hopefully in many cases, he'll be talking to people that you would have heard of. Um, But, but he'll be bringing his distinctive um, Steve, you know, levitation form of inquiry to them. And that, and that'll be, um, that'll be our, our probably next show. And then we've got a few others in the, um, in the pipeline, including a, a free economics book club, which we just sort of piloted as a free economics radio episode. The, um, the, uh, the episode was called how to make your own luck. And it, it featured the, the journalist Maria Konnikova, who's written a wonderful book about learning to play poker from scratch. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I just finished that. Yeah. Did you like Fantastic. it? Fantastic. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. It was really good. So we, our only mistake was piloting this. So I had this idea for a new show, you know, as a book writer, I was always frustrated with the interview process. When you get to go promote your book, the questions you would get asked are kind of somewhere between basic and, you know, dumb. And, and then there are, there, there are no stupid questions. <laughs> well, in book publishing, it turns out there are. And, uh, and the worst part is, as the author, like you've spent five years in your hovel, right? Slaving over every word. And now you have like, you know, four minutes or if you're lucky, 12 minutes to summarize your book. And then inevitably you do a not very good job of it because you wrote the book. You didn't work on summarizing it. So the the idea for this new format was to do a, an episode where we would interview the author, hopefully well, but then also have excerpts of the book read by the author, or if the author is not a good reader, someone else. So we did that with Maria Konnikova. And our mistake is that she's so good at both as as a writer and an interviewee and a reader of her own work that she set the bar high. So we may never <laughs> do another one again, even though I'd, I'd like to. <laughs> well, you, you know, um, I always have these ideas for books and I, and I just, I kind of realized that for me, 90% of my enjoyment of a book, completed book <laughs> was the cover. So now I just design covers for books that I will never write that are really great. Well, have you thought about getting other people to write those books so that you could use the <laughs> cover the next more step, properly? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure on TaskRabbit, you know, there's people yeah. just waiting to write books there. I'm sure. Well, I think if I have a cover and maybe the summary, and then I could do the tour. That's all. That's all I would need. <laughs> there you go. You know, you might want to talk to Jim Patterson, the Jim <laughs> Patterson, because he's got like a really great factory. Yeah. And maybe, uh, you know, you're coming at it from the other side. Maybe he wants to write your books, Kevin. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. <right. laughs> well, this has been wonderful, Stephen. Uh, um, thank you for sharing um, your picks. We we love ones that are different from everybody else, and that's what you've given us. And um, if people want to find out more about your radio network, um, they just had is it, is it called Freakonomics Radio Network? Is that the I think, name of it? Yeah, I think Google just likes the word. I think Google likes the word Freakonomics or any search engine. Yeah, if you search for Freakonomics Radio, that'll get you to basically our website where where things are to be found. But mostly, we actually try to discourage people, not discourage people, but we, you know, podcast apps are the way to find it. So, um, but I guess it does help to know the names of shows, even with um, most apps. So yeah, Freakonomics Radio is our main one. No Stupid Questions is the the new one that we've already launched, we've been at that a couple months now, and then the one that Levitt will be launching in uh, l- mid to late August is called People I Mostly Admire with the word mostly in parenthesis. That sounds great. Steven, thanks so much. This was a real pleasure speaking with you. My pleasure. Great to talk to both of you. And um, I-, I really do want to thank you for all the cool tools you guys have turned me on to over the years. The knife sharpener I couldn't live without on and on. So um, thank you. Hey everybody, it's your host Mark and I wanted to thank you for listening to the Cool Tools show and I also wanted to let you know that we've got a lot more going on at Cool Tools than just this podcast. We also have the Cool Tools website which has a new tool review every day and you can get there by going to cool-tools.org. 
We also have four different newsletters that you can subscribe to, and you can subscribe to those from the Cool Tools page. We have this podcast that you're listening to right now. We also have a YouTube channel where we review tools. Check that YouTube channel out by going to youtube.com slash cool tools. And one of the things I'd like to ask you is if you're really enjoying everything that we are producing, go to our Patreon page and support us there. You can sign up and give us as little as $1 a month, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that we get from Patreon goes towards a lot of things. We transcribe our podcast interviews so that you can read them online. We pay for editing of our podcasts and for our videos. We pay our contributors. We have video production costs. We have equipment costs. We have hosting costs. And the money you give us through Patreon also goes to support Cool Tools Lab. Anything you give is a huge help. And one of the things that we do is if you are a contributor to Patreon, we'll give you a shout out on air. And so I have a few people here to thank this week. Mark Lyonaj, Micah Gates, Monty Zukowski, Patrick James McNally, Robert Cohen, Scott Spence Lloyd, Steve Avery, Steve Golden, Steve Levine, Tom Hess, William Phillips, Aaron Nipper, Darab Patel, Glenn Mercer, Jay Walker, Jeff Bonner, Ryan Jarrell, Pat Daly, Patrick Kennedy, Troy Wallet, Mike Camerate, Nicole Harkin, Tim Youssef, Scott Reed. Thanks all of you for supporting Cool Tools. And if you would like to have a shout out, go over to the Patreon page and sign up. And thanks for listening to the Cool Tools Podcast. We'll see you next week.